suddenly sun. Over my shoulder in the middle of gray November, what I hope to do comes back, asking. Across the street, the fiery trees hold on to their leaves, red and gold in the final months of this unfinished year. They offer blazing riddles. In the frozen fields of my life, there are no shortcuts to spring. But stories of great birds in migration carrying small ones on their backs, predators flying next to warblers they would in a different season eat. Stunned by the astonishing mix in this uneasy world that plunges in a single day from despair to hope and back again. I commend my life to Ruskin's difficult duty of delight and to that most beautiful form of courage to be happy. Nancy has been attending KUUF for two years and recently became a member. She has a passion for labyrinths, and she's excited about helping to create a labyrinth for our community. Let us light chalices together with these words from Alice Anachika Nosman. In a time of uncertainty, when so many things around us are constantly changing, each day new developments, rising numbers, changing guidelines, when the world we live in suddenly seems upside down and topsy-turvy, we light our chalice to remind ourselves of our grounding in our faith. We remember that the flaming chalice came into being as a beacon of hope during World War II, a secret symbol that offered help. In the midst of it all, we wrap ourselves in the warm light of a familiar flame, a reminder of the strength that emerges when we come together in community. As we hold in our hearts those joys and sorrows shared today in whatever way is comfortable for you as we come together for prayer and meditation with these words inspired by those of the Reverend Vanessa Rush Southern. Life can be complicated and uncertain, yet abundant with some things we can count on. It has seasons of struggle and seasons of delight. And sometimes the two blow in and bloom simultaneously, like now, maybe always. And we are here together, breathing together, seeking together, holding each other through it all, laughing and singing in the face of it, if there is a journey to liberation, if there is a way to live resurrection, I think it is like this. May we claim what gives us life, hope, and joy, sinking our roots down into what grounds us, reaching toward the sun. May we open our hearts to the abundance of this creation that surrounds and sustains us. Amen. Late historian and activist, Howard Zinn. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however a small, small a way, 
We don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presents. And to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy, my heart is too heavy for me to remember that I have been called to dance the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up, and to lift others up. O oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. Religion. The words are by Theodore Parker. Now, a characteristic that makes Theodore Parker my favorite historic Unitarian is the way he combines his undaunted sense of justice with limitless optimism. If you're not familiar with who Theodore Parker is, here's a brief version of his story. He lived from 1810 to 1860, and he rose to fame as a controversial, even heretical Unitarian minister whose militant opposition to slavery demonstrated his firm belief that the arc of the moral universe could bend toward a more just world. Yes, that famous saying often used by the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. originated with Theodore Parker. Well, Parker applied his energy and his force of will to several social reform causes, including women's rights, temperance, and the abolition of slavery. As a minister, he played a pivotal role in moving Unitarianism away from a Bible-centered faith. And in 1841, he gave an ordination sermon entitled, A Discourse on the Transient and the Permanent in Christianity. And in giving that sermon, he emerged as a major, major figure in the Transcendentalist movement, joining Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and Margaret Fuller. And Parker was a popular preacher. His services at the Boston church he served drew up to 2,000 people. Parker's anti-slavery work intensified with the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850, and he became part of the Secret Six. Now, that was a group of wealthy benefactors in the Boston area, including some Unitarian ministers who supplied the radical John Brown with money and supplies as he planned that raid on Harper's Ferry. Parker devoted himself to working tirelessly for the causes that he fervently believed were the fulfillment of the hope and the promise of this country. Throughout his life, he held on to the optimistic faith that liberation and possibilities for fulfilling lives for all people were possible. Now, in that tumultuous decade of the 1850s that led to the outbreak of the Civil War, Parker believed that the faith he served held that promise. And we heard those words in that hymn we sang earlier, a religion that like sunshine goes everywhere, its temple, all space, its shrine, the good heart, its creed, all truth, its ritual, all works of love. Now, lot, not long before Parker's death at age 49 from the tuberculosis that took so many members of his family, he wrote, many acorns must be sown to have one come up. Even then, the plant grows slowly, but it is an oak at last. Parker knew, knew very well, that the work for liberation did not produce instant results. But nevertheless, 
That work deserved each person's commitment. And although he died before Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was issued, Parker sustained his spirit and his soul through the joy he found in possibility and in hope. His sunshine, his optimism is needed today. No doubt he would advise us that we need only look around us to find the source for that optimism and tap into it. Adrienne Marie Brown writes, true pleasure, joy, happiness, and satisfaction has been the force that helps us move beyond the constant that is struggle, that helps us live and generate futures beyond this dystopic present toward a future worthy of our own miraculous lives. Brown continues, pleasure, embodied, connected pleasure, is one of the ways we know we are free, there are, that we are always free, that we always have the power to co-create this world. Pleasure and joy help us move through the times that are unfair, through grief and loneliness, through the terror of genocide, or days when the demands are just overwhelming us. Pleasure and joy heal the places where our hearts and our spirits get wounded. Pleasure and joy remind us that even in the dark, we are alive. Pleasure and joy are medicine for the suffering that is absolutely promised in this life. No, we cannot deny this world's suffering. We cannot deny the angst that builds in us when we read the latest news or watch on television as cities are being destroyed by deadly missiles. We may find ourselves in a state of existential dread, that, that dread that creeps into our hearts, suffering in the world. Yet, even as we recognize and work to alle alleviate that suffering, it is important that this work not become overwhelming, that it destroy us. Surely, an antidote to this angst is needed. And that's where joy comes in. Joy has long been recognized as one way to counteract the dread that can stifle heart and mind and spirit. In the ancient Hebrew scriptures, a verse in Proverbs tells us, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Our modern medical authorities also recognize that joy is good medicine. The Mayo Clinic has reported that about 27% of US adults, that's us, say they are so stressed most days, they are unable to function. Over 75% experienced at least one stress-related symptom in this past month. And that symptom might be headache, or fatigue, or nervousness, or just feeling depressed. A recommendation from the Mayo Clinic doctors? Take a dose of joy. You don't even have to swallow a pill. <laughs> Feeling, feelings of contentment and joy can positively improve physical and mental health and overall well-being. So what exactly is joy? If I'm happy, am I experiencing joy? Well, happiness and joy are emotions that share some common traits and are often experienced at the same time, but can be distinguished by some subtle nuances. Usually happiness is the emotional reaction to what is happening around you. For example, you've been circling the Costco parking lot <laughs> seemingly forever, and a person just pulled out of the space, and it's right across from the entrance. That's happiness. 
your reaction to something taking place in your life at the moment. However, joy isn't a reactionary emotion. It's more a state of being resulting from having a sense of purpose in life. Now, while you're in Costco, you buy those large plastic wrap packages of tuna fish and peanut butter to take to the food bank when you volunteer with your neighborhood group. That's joy. I think many of us experienced happiness and joy this morning. Number one, the power came on. And I'm sure the worship committee and the tech people were very happy about that. But the joy experience is the opportunity when we come here together and see each other's faces and be in this beloved community. So joy means you are not necessarily happy and giddy, but you certainly can appreciate those moments of happiness in your life. One of the medical experts at the Mayo Clinic describes this difference in her own life. She says, happiness is fleeting, but my joy still drives me on a terrible day because I have a purpose in life. I still have joy even during a horrible time. She adds, I think of joy as a ripple or a domino. On my medical team, we share a connection of wanting to care for women and children. This shared purpose and joy builds a connection between every one of us on the team. And when you link joy together with others, it becomes even stronger. No, joy isn't experienced in a vacuum. Most of the time, it's a feeling or sentiment that spreads to others through your attitude and actions. My friend and colleague, the Reverend Summer Albiati, writing in the recent Pacific Western Region newsletter, suggests that in our Unitarian Universalist communities, actions rooted in commonly shared face values can provide joy. Values that affirm goodness in life and in our fellow human beings. Values of justice, equity, pluralism, generosity, interdependence, all centered on that foundation of love. Values. Those are what we hold amidst inevitable and sometimes difficult and stressful conditions. Shared values that reflect our desire for collective liberation and freedom. Joy wells up when those values are made real and when we become engaged in them. By working with our neighbors in a community garden, volunteering for a voter registration drive, by joining efforts to ensure gender and reproductive justice, by supporting climate change education, or by collaborating to prepare meals for those who lack the simple pleasure of a warm dinner served with a smile. And you don't have to go far to tap into that joy. You can find others engaged in joyful action right here in this fellowship. Just think for a moment of the ways you have found joy here with others in this community. And joy is compounded when you are engaged in activities with others who share positive and affirming values. Summer Albiati reminds us that not everyone may have the bandwidth to engage at that moment. She says, that's okay. Gather yourself, take a moment, do what you need to do and get yourself ready for what may come because our collective liberation remains on the agenda. And love remains at the center of that agenda, she says, as long as we hold on to values that state everyone, everyone is worthy of that love. And as long as we believe that, we will remain rooted and strong, unwavering and resolute. The poet Mary Oliver writes, we shake with joy, we shake with grief. What a time they have, she says. 
These two housed as they are in the same body. Yes, we must recognize and reckon with the suffering in the world around us, and while working to alleviate that suffering, not become overwhelmed by it. A commitment to see good and recognize the presence of good in the world and in ourselves is the strongest source of joy that we have in our lives. While always aware of bad events in the world, we can tap into that joy, that sense of connection to life itself, and help us con confront injustice and work toward good for all. Joy, joy is the fuel that helps keep us going when we might want to give up. The clinical psychologist, Jessica Young Brown, observes, as many cultures that have experienced historical violence and trauma can attest, joy is often the thing that helps us survive the unspeakable. It is no accident that we find moments of laughter at memorial services. No accident that we spent the first few months of the pandemic lockdown making jokes on the internet. Joy reminds us that when we are alive, we have things feel good, even though they might feel perilous. Joy and sorrow can and will coexist. Be intentional about accessing joy by holding time for the things that, you f that make you feel most content, most at peace. For some, it might be physical exercise or spending time with beloved friends or family. For others, it might be time in nature, cooking, listening to music, playing volleyball at the park, or as I do with a group at my aerobics class, we do it, play volleyball in the pool. Some find joy and energy by joining other enthusiastic volunteers to work on a political campaign for a candidate or an issue. There is no one right way, says Brown. Joy is a resource that can enhance our lives but we must decide to make it part of our lives. We must actively seek it out rather than waiting for it to come to us. So how do you seek it out? Try asking yourself, what makes me feel most alive? Several people in this congregation have said singing in our choir on Sundays brings them great joy. It lifts their hearts and their spirits. Others find that in cooking, then enjoying the abundance of your monthly potluck. So ask yourself, what brings you joy? Your sources may be different from that person next to you. And of course, they are everywhere. Some find joy in caring for others, spending time at the beach or discovering an author whose work they love, taking an art class, Others discover joy in developing relationships or developing their own personal empowerment. Having meaningful activities and a purpose, having that purpose replenishes physical and emotional energy and helps develop resilience during these tough times that we always have. Perhaps enjoying the summer to rest in your lawn chair offers exquisite joy. And what's not to like about that? So just find enjoyment where you are. It's important to recognize that many possible stressors in life are outside of our control. The weather last night, for example. The behavior of other people, our past, natural disasters. Other aspects of our lives exist without our input, believe it or not. So while building joy, focus time and energy on things that can be controlled. One of those Mayo Clinic doctors says, I've learned not to internalize things I can't control. This frees me up to better navigate 
the situation and focus on my personal happiness and mental health. Great advice, but not always easily done. So he offers a tip. Decide which parts of a stressful situation are outside of your control, then make the intentional decision to shift attention to things you can change instead of spending time ruminating on something that is out of control, like the weather, decide to see the good in something and choose joy. I think there was some joy just lis listening to the thunder and lightning and seeing the lightning last night. You just yep. have to have a lot of joy just in this amazing power of this nature in which we live. Joy can also be found in expressions of gratitude, being thankful or showing appreciation for things or people around you. And this could mean sending positive thoughts to someone special or writing a card or text message to a friend, listing some things you're grateful for each day and that you appreciate about them. And practicing this daily helps your brain shift its focus to appreciation and blessings instead of problems and challenges. Being deliberate by listing blessings help you recognize, even among the stressful things that are so many, that all sorts of good things happen in our lives. And joy can indeed be found in building our relationships. Each of us, to varying degrees, needs connection with others. Recognize what is great in others and then lift them up. Cheering them on helps us recognize the good things in ourselves as well. In working to develop more joy, keep perspective on which situations and decisions are monumental and which may be only little annoyances. Recently, a colleague in Colorado shared a poem with me that speaks to that perspective for people of any age. In that poem, Curmudgeons of Joy, the writer Ju Judy Shook writes, they say as you get older, you get more set in your ways. And that's all right with me. I'm getting set in my ways. In fact, I am getting downright stubborn. I refuse to believe that greed will triumph over justice that racism is an incurable disease, that hunger and poverty cannot be overcome, that our planet cannot be restored as a garden of life. I am stubborn in my faith and optimism. I am tenacious in love, constant in compassion, unwavering in my ability to laugh, especially at myself. I hope many of you are getting set in these ways, too. Let us be curmudgeons of joy, she writes. And this, of course, is the way we dare to hope and celebrate life, even as we may face in our personal lives or in the world's life disappointments and instances of defeat. We see the brokenness in individuals and social systems, and yet we must celebrate. We must celebrate who we are and how we are part of this hopeful community of souls, changing lives, communities, laws, and society for the better. I'm sure Theodore Parker would see himself as a curmudgeon of joy. Yes, he recognized that much work remained to be done but he no doubt would find time to celebrate. He was part of the effort that was changing lives. No, he did not see, live to see the fulfillment of his hope for liberation, but his energy, his hope, yes, his joy in his work inspired generations who followed to continue that work, work that continues to be fully realized even today. When we celebrate, when we celebrate our finest values and find that sacred hope within us, 
we are spiritually energized and driven in truly holy directions. We're moved toward one another into loving interconnection, into deeper relationships with all that is sacred in this life. So as you move through the next few days, be on the lookout for those moments of Southern connection and joy. Keep your cup of joy filled, filled by reaching out to others, staying engaged in our shared world. Then do something really radical. Choose joy. Amen, and so may it be. And we have our chalice. Join me as we extinguish our chalice here in the sanctuary with these words of the 13th century Sufi mystic Rumi. <clears throat> On a day when the wind is perfect, the sail just needs to open, and the world is full of beauty. Today is such a day. Amen.